All right, good morning everybody and welcome to our second fun training session. Uh, this time we'll be talking about uh, an introduction to parallel programming in Fortran. Uh, so hopefully you all in, get, uh, get something useful out of this. Um, we'll be covering mostly just kind of the, the basics of parallel programming and, in Fortran and uh, with a couple of different uh, ways of doing so. And hopefully that'll be uh, something that's useful for you. All right, so the agenda for today. Um, so for day one, for the first part, uh, we'll, we'll do kind of an introduction to some parallel programming concepts and models. Um, I'm gonna have Justin give us a, kind of an introduction to performance profiling with the Cray performance analysis tools. Uh, typically called Cray Pat. Um, and then we'll take like a 30 minute break for lunch or so. Uh, and then we'll do uh, for, for the second part of day one, um, some parallel programming patterns with do concurrent and then some with OpenMP. And then we'll kind of look at some, you know, real world examples, or at least more real world than, you know, your typical just hello world. Um, just how, how do we apply the, these uh, these programming models, either do concurrent or open MP to something like a real world example. Um, and then tomorrow we'll go over uh, MPI and co arrays and how to apply those to an example and uh, we'll have time for plenty of questions and working on some exercises and things like that. Um, so welcome. Um, for uh, if you're not speaking, it's appreciated if you make sure that you're muted uh, if you're not speaking. Um, for the purposes of us to try and keep track of attendance a little bit easier, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, make sure that you're, you've got uh, first name and last name as the display name for your Zoom client so we can kind of keep track of uh, what, what's our attendance look like. Um, if you want to view the uh, closed captions, feel free to do that. Um, we are recording and so the video will be available, be made available. We'll put the link on the event page for this training session um, and it'll be posted to YouTube. Uh, apply for a training account. If you don't have a NERSC account yet, um, you can go to that link at uh, iris.nurse.gov slash train and use that code DJQO. Uh, we'll, we'll get you a, a temporary training account so that you can uh, follow along with the examples. Um, for questions, uh, please go post your questions in the Google Doc at this link. Uh, I see Helen has also posted the link in the Zoom chat. Uh, oh, uh, second thought, the, the second link that she posted there. Um, we'll have some, some people helping to monitor that. Uh, as we're going through, uh, as I'm doing all the presentations, because it's kind of hard for me to monitor that and, and give a presentation at the same time. Uh, but uh, I will be reviewing that uh, periodically and looking for questions and we'll try and make sure that we get answers to all of the questions if you post them in that Google Doc. Especially, you know, I'll, I'll go through and make sure when we're all done that all of the questions have been uh, satisfactorily answered. And when we're done, we will try and distribute a survey. So we would greatly appreciate any feedback you can give us on the training. Uh, we want to keep putting on these trainings for you and we want to make sure that they're useful and helpful. And so any feedback that you can provide that helps us uh, make improvements, uh, we greatly appreciate it. So we'll, we'll distribute that survey at the end. Um, so let me make sure that I can open up that uh, Q&A doc. So as I said, post questions. Um, so I will periodically switch over and take a look at those uh, as we go through things. That is the wrong one. Here we go. All right. So logistics continued. Um, I'm going to be going through some example code. Uh, you can find all of that material at the following GitHub repository. So feel free to clone that. I'll be doing all of the examples on Perlmutter using the Cray Fortran compiler. All of the examples have been tested with the Cray Fortran compiler. 
other Fortran compilers may work, but some may, for some examples, maybe they, they might, they might not. So just for sake of everybody being consistent, if you want to use the, the Cray Fortran compiler, that that's the one I, I can definitely say what should work for all the examples. Um, there's also a reservation for the day for, uh, so, ah. um, so if you want to use the reservation, that'll give you, uh, uh, a shared, you can get a shared uh, portion of a node uh, to run all of these examples on uh, for the duration of today and tomorrow. Um, so if you want to use that reservation, just add that to your salloc command and then you or and or your srun command and then you can have access to uh, a little bit faster queue uh, for for working through the examples. Um, speaking of which, I am going to get myself logged into the reservation. So I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code. I've got it uh, connected up to uh, Perlmutter already. So I'm going to be doing all the editing and running the examples from the Visual Studio Code um, and the terminal there. So I'm going to go ahead and get that uh, logged into Hey Brett, do you mind make the font a little bit bigger? I can go a little bit bigger. It's always that balancing act of is it big yeah. enough for everybody to read, but does it fit on the screen? <laughs> but hopefully that should be big enough. Let's see. Why does it think that that does not work? I knew I should have done this 10 minutes ago. Um, Let me check. I'm pretty sure it will work without the reservation. So I, I was... Um, yeah. So maybe N train 6 is not working correctly. It is reserved as entry six, but by for now you can just do the demonstration without the reservation. Oh, check. That's fine. Um, yeah, I I can I can just do this. It'll just take it a second, a second longer for me to get a an interactive session, but that'll uh, run in the back. That'll get connected here in the background while I keep going through some slides. So not a big deal. Um, but we've got we've got a handful of people on uh, for logistics type questions. So if you if you're running into logistics issues, uh, questions in the doc or uh, in the Zoom chat should be fine. To hope hopefully somebody can get you up and running. Um, all right, so let's start with introduction to parallel programming models. So we'll just go over some of the basics uh, about parallel programming and uh, some some of the concepts involved and things to think about. Um, first thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, it's called Amdel's Law. And basically what it says is you can't, it, it's, it's the mathematical description of you cannot make a task take any less time than the longest part of that task will take. Right. And so even if you can take a section of your program and make it infinitely scale and run in parallel, meaning that that portion of the, the program will now take zero time, well, the rest of the time that your program takes doesn't get any shorter, right? So, so there really are just fundamental limits to how much you can speed up a program's execution by making it run in parallel. Um, and it's highly dependent on how much of that work actually can be done in parallel. So, you know, if, if half of your program can be run in parallel and it, that half scales perfectly such that you could scale it to run on every single core in Perlmutter, you're still only going to make that program take half as long to run. Um, as you get to larger portions, you can get, you know, more speed up and, and make programs go faster, but there really is kind of a fundamental limit. And so it's, it's important to understand 
when you're trying to make a program run in parallel that there, there's an aspect of that. And, and like I said, the, one of the other aspects of this is that, you know, if there's some fundamental task of your program that really just has to be done in a specific order and every program is going to have this, this situation, like whatever the, the shortest sequential or whatever the longest sequential sequence of things that has to be accomplished, that's how long your program absolutely has to take because there's just no way of getting around that. There, if there's dependence on an order of execution, the longest sequence of that is how long your program will take. Um, and of course, for parallel execution, there is no perfectly scalable zero overhead way of making things run in parallel. There's always going to be some cost or overhead to spinning up threads, communications over a network, whatever it is, there's some overhead associated with that. So you, so while this is going to explain what the ideal speed up might be there, you're never going to actually hit ideal speed ups because the real world isn't ideal. Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure that we kind of understood this concept so that you don't expect that, okay, now I'm going to be able to just, you know, flip a switch and my program will all of a sudden take zero time because I can throw all of the Perlmutter at it. No, there, there are some other things to think about in terms of, you know, how fast can I get my program to go? And where should I spend time trying to make my program run in parallel to go faster? Um, so now we can talk a little bit about parallel programming models. Um, there, there's a couple of different um, uh, axes along which you can kind of talk about parallelism. Um, one, one of which is, is uh, something like uh, process interaction. So something like uh, uh, two processes, two, your computer's doing two different things and those things are gonna talk back and forth to each other. You can do uh, things like uh, shared memory. So uh, those two processes are actually you know, uh, using, making use of the exact same memory on a, a, a machine. And so they can just kind of read each other's memory and, and they can talk to each other that way. Message passing is another one, is another uh, popular one that allows things to go over the network. So processes running on different machines, they can send messages back and forth to each other. Um, uh, partitioned global address space is kind of a way of making that a bit more um, opaque uh, and, and automatic. So it's a parallel programming model where you can think of the, the individual processes as having a shared memory, but it's, it's kind of more explicit of like, this is an address space that is accessible from different processes but it's it's explicit that if I'm going to be accessing some specific memory that I am accessing it on a different process. And there's also some implicit interaction uh, between processes that can happen, um, but we won't quite go into as much detail on those. Um, then there then there's how do you kind of decompose the problem to make some of the different things uh, happen in parallel. Uh, one, one way that you can do that is called task parallelism. So I've got different things that need to be done and I can have different processes work on those different things and then come back together at some point. Uh, another way is called data parallelism. Um, so I've got a, a whole bunch of data and I need to perform the same kinds of operations on that data. Um, well, I can just have multiple processes all doing the same thing and just operating on different chunks of data. We can talk about stream parallelism. Um, I'm a bit less familiar with this one. It's going to be something along the lines of I've got one process sending data to multiple other processes. Um, and those are going to be operating on maybe different chunks of some data, um, stuff like that. Um, so, but this, this picture on the right is kind of like, we've got single instruction stream, single data, th this is serial execution. Like 
I've got one process that's going to do one thing at a time. That's serial ex that's going to be serial execution. If we want to talk about single instruction stream, multiple data stream. So this is um, this is that uh, kind of data parallelism thing. Is like I've got a bunch of pieces of data. I need to do the same operations on all of them. Well, I can have multiple thing. I can have multiple processes doing the same operations on different different elements of that data set. Um, we can go down, go down to the, the green one, multiple instruction stream, single data stream. This is kind of more of a danger zone <laughs> um, because if, if I've got multiple processes working on the same data, we really have to coordinate who's touching what data because the, it can lead to things called race conditions. But then if we got a uh, multiple instruction stream, multiple data stream, that, that's kind of that task parallelism aspect of things of like, I've got multiple things to do on different data. We, we can have multiple processes working on different, different tasks and then, and then uh, put things back together later. So that this is kind of uh, one way of looking at a breakdown of different parallel programming models and in uh, different ways of decomposing that idea. Um, a different kind of way of looking at it looks kind of more more at the view of from like the hardware aspect of things of like different levels of where where can we get some parallelism in, involved in executing code. Um, at the lowest level, modern processors can perform a, a sync from a single instruction can do the the same operation on multiple elements of a data set with a single instruction. So it'd be you know one single clock cycle of the processor can perform an instruction on more than one piece of data. And so uh, this is usually called vector or SIMD instructions. And at the for the most part your optimizing compilers are going to be able to just automatically transform certain parts of your code and go, oh, I see that this could be done with the, this level of parallelism. We can just grab a chunk of data, have the processor from one cycle just do the same operation on more, more than one element of that data set, and uh, so we can get a little bit of parallelism that way. The next level is shared memory. Um, so since modern processors have more than one core in them, um, we can take advantage of the fact that those cores have access to the same memory. Um, so this is, uh, you know, we're, we've got, well, we'll do use something like threads or so, you know, with OpenMP, which we'll talk about, um, or do concurrent. This is kind of the level of parallelism that we're going to be talking about where it's like we're kind of assuming shared memory as as part of the that level of parallelism which means we don't have to worry about going over a network there's less concern about um, communication and, and uh, uh, coordination uh, but uh, but you're then limited to just kind of a single machine Distributed memory is where we get thing, systems like Perlmutter, where we've got a whole bunch of machines kind of networked together. So you've got different machines that then have to communicate to coordinate, do the coordination of, you know, doing operations in parallel. Um, so you and usually that's going to mean, you know, we have to package up some data and send it over to another machine so that it can do its portion of the calculations and maybe send it back or send it on to another machine. Um, but there's a, there's a lot more coordination involved and data communication that has to happen. And finally, we can talk briefly just touch on this, that this is kind of an aspect of where modern software is heading for large scale systems. Um, is more like distributed machines, whereas like I don't even care what hardware or where the hardware is, I've got some communication that's ha going to happen, and there's some service provider out there that gives me you know some 
some web address that I can just send this off to and say, hey, could you please do this calculation for me? Um, if you've heard terms like microservices, that's kind of along the lines of something like this, or AWS Lambda, or you know, a handful of different service providers that provide like kind of on-demand computation without you having to requisition a whole machine or spin up a, a virtual machine or something like that. It's it's like yeah, I need I've got some piece of calculation and somebody else go do it please and get back to me with an answer. Um, we won't go over that aspect of things today, um, but. As you start to get more into how do we do parallel computation, this is an avenue that you could start to explore for large scale systems. Um, but what we're probably what we're mainly going to be focusing on for today is the shared memory aspect of things, and for tomorrow, uh, the distributed memory aspect. Um, so let's talk a little bit about parallel programming in Fortran specifically. So we've got a couple. Like I said, we're going to be talking about shared memory and distributed memory. Um, there are a couple of different ways that are the most popular for a, achieving those couple of uh, ways of parallel programming. Um, natively, Fortran has a construct called do concurrent, which says these iterate the iterations of these loops can be done in parallel. Um, and so, so there's a, there's a native construct in the language that allows you to express that that property of your code. Uh, the common extension out there is OpenMP, which is a way of kind of like decorating your code and then turning turning on a special option in your compiler that says, "Hey, look look at these special comments and and do the transformation on the code because it's decorated in such a way where I'm saying, hey, th these things can be done in parallel." Here's how I want you to implement that parallelism. For distributed memory things, uh, the, the Fortran language has as a native aspect of the language uh, something called coarrays, which is a way of expressing the idea of multiple processes. Uh, and specifically, it doesn't talk about where those processes might live, so the, the communication is kind of inherently allowed to be cross machines, i.e. distributed memory. Um, the common library that you might use is MPI. Um, there are some co-array implementations that basically just use MPI under the hood, but uh, you could use MPI directly if, if you didn't want to use the, the native feature of the language. Um, but M MPI is explicitly a distributed memory type library where you're saying, hey, I want to communicate to this other process. So, uh, so it can inherently be distributed memory. Now, so as we start talking about parallel programming, there are some new classes of bugs that appear uh, when you're trying to implement parallel execution of code. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about those so you can kind of be on the lookout for them as you start to take some of these ideas and apply them to your own codes. Um, so parallel bugs related to parallel execution are notoriously hard to detect and debug. And there are a couple of classes of the, these bugs. Um, uh, race conditions, which is there's some calculation that depends on another calculation either having been completed or at least not being done at the exact same time as another one. Um, and so you, you end up with what's called race conditions. Um, and that generally has to do with uh, contradictory data access or something, something along those lines where, you know, if, if process A is trying to increment a variable by one and process B is trying to increment a variable by one, well, if, if they don't do that in such a way that it's, there's some coordination involved or, or at least some you know, mutual exclusion that's going to happen, you know, I, I, I read the value, process A reads the value, process B reads the value, they both add one to it and then they store it back in the, in the, as the answer. Well, we kind of expected that value after those operations to have been incremented by two, but 
if they happened at exactly the same time, maybe they only end up incrementing that value by one. Um, and these are notoriously hard to detect because they won't happen deterministically, right? Pro sometimes process A might complete its whole operation before process B gets there or vice versa. And a lot of times that is the case where it, it appears like things are working, but sometimes they conflict and we get the wrong answer. And so because they don't happen all the time, they're really hard to detect and debug. So th this is the kind of thing that you really want to be thinking about and on the lookout for when you're trying to develop parallel algorithms and, and take your code parallel, because you may not even realize that you've introduced a bug for some time. Um, the other class, uh, deadlock, and kind of like a subset of that idea is uh, live lock. Is generally you're gonna do you're gonna be doing some sort of um, coordination between processes for you know hey I need to do I need to complete this whole operation on this set of data before anybody else looks at it right so I'm about to start doing something I want I want, need to make sure that everybody else waits while I'm in the middle of this or else something you know we're going to have a race condition so you're going to implement something you know that says process a needs to wait while process b is touching this but there are some scenarios where it's like i need i need access to more than one thing i need everybody to wait while i'm accessing those things well that but a different process might only need access to one of those things so Process A grabs access to, to data set uh, one, and process B grabs access to data set two, and now process A is going to wait on process B because it needs access to data set two. But process B is now going to wait on process A because it also needs access to data set one. So now two processes are waiting on each other and neither of them is going to make progress because they're waiting to make process on the other one, right? And this is called a deadlock. Another scenario is, uh, is what's called live lock where it's, hey, I noticed that I'm in the middle of a deadlock. Well, let me release and try again and hopefully some, somebody will have made progress. Well, you can end up in a, in a cycle where it looks like they're still doing, like processes are still doing something. But they're not actually making progress. Like they're, they're, you know, performing operations, but they're not actually making progress because they're, you know, hey, I grabbed this thing. Oh, wait, I, I'm not ready for it yet. And, and you just end up in this loop, of, this infinite loop of not ever making progress on, on the calculations you're intending to. Okay, so... So let's talk a little bit about some more concrete examples to help kind of think about some of these things. Um, so generally we're going to think in terms of data dependencies. So for the couple of statements on the left, can we operate, can we perform those two statements in parallel? Can we, can we execute those two statements in parallel? And the answer here is, well, yeah, I, I, the first statement only needs access to the data in X and it's going to store it in Y. And so, and then the second statement only needs access to the data in W and it's going to store it in Z. There, there's no conflicting data accesses here. So yeah, we could, we could execute those two statements in parallel. But what about the statements on the right? Well, if I tried to execute the second statement first, well, we don't have the answer stored in Y yet. So the answer is no. And these are examples where it's pretty obvious, right? I cannot, I cannot execute the second statement on the right-hand side before the first statement because there's clearly a data dependency there on variable Y. But there are some scenarios where it's not quite so obvious. Um, they start to get a little bit harder to notice when we start talking about loops. So the loop on the left, 
I could do every single one of those iterations in parallel. They're all independent. The only, the only dependence is on the iteration variable, the index variable i, for each iteration. So there, and it's only storing its data in an, each individual element of x, right? So, so they're all independent. So yeah, we could do that loop in parallel. What about the loop on the right? Well, no, we can't do any of these iterations in parallel because every iteration depends on the previous one right i can't start this loop until i've executed the first assignment statement given a value to the first element of x and every iteration in the loop says i, I need the value from the previous iteration so we absolutely have to do this loop sequentially and again this example is relatively easy to spot because um, because we've, we've got this explicit index variable that's kind of showing us what is the data that we're accessing uh, to do the calculations and where are we storing that data. So we've got i and i minus 1. You go, oh, okay, so i minus 1 has to have been calculated before I can get the value for i. So yeah, we have to do them in order. Well, let's start to look at... Uh, some examples where it's not quite so obvious. So starting with the, the couple of statements on the right hand side, can I execute those two statements in parallel? At first glance you might think, well yeah, the value that's going to get calculated for x doesn't depend on the value that gets calculated on y and vice versa, but it turns out you can't actually do that. <laughs> the the random number subroutine is going is looking at some shared data there, there it's got some state that it's keeping track of so that it knows okay i've calculated this random number i'm not going to give you the same random number back over and over again i've got to keep track of some state so that i can give you a different number every time you call it but if i execute those two things out of order right if i did them out of order which is a way that you can think about parallel execution is what if I did things in a different order? Would I still get the same answer? The answer is no, you can't do them in parallel either. Um, so if I did these out of order, well, y would get a different, y would get the, the value that x had got, right? So if I just did them in reverse order, I've got, I'd end up with a value stored in, in the other, vari the opposite variable. If I do them in parallel, because of the internal computations and the and the state that is kept track of in inside of the calculation for generating the random numbers, it's possible that those states are just going to muck each other up and I'm going to get completely different answers. Like I'm not even going to get the same two random numbers in different in different variables. I might get completely different numbers and I might even break the state of the random number generator. So no, the, those two cannot be executed in parallel, even though at first glance you might think they could. Um, I see that somebody doesn't see the slides. I could stop and restart the sharing if that, let me do that real quick. Share that. All right, can everybody see them now? Pull the chat back up. Now I don't see the chat. Well, that's not good. Let me stop again. <laughs> Close the chat. Share again. says I'm sharing. Pull that over now. Let me see if I can get the chat to pull back up. Hmm. Well, now I cannot see the chat. So if people are reporting seeing um, seeing slide, that's fine. Report. Yeah. All right. 
Well, I can't see the chat now, so if anybody could pipe up if there's something that I need to address in the chat. That, that would be very helpful. All right. Um, so, but the, so for the example on the left-hand side, can we execute those statements on the left in parallel? Well, we don't have enough information to know because we don't know what the function func does. From looking at those statements, they look independent func takes the value from x and stores and then it's we're going to store the result in y and then it's going to take the value from w and store the result in z but we don't know what func does it might look at global state it might modify global state and if that's the case then no we can't operate those we can't perform those statements in parallel this comes down to a coding style generally, which is you want I, the, the style that I tend to uh, promote is that you want your functions, you want your functions not to modify global state. Because if I know that I follow that convention, that my functions do not modify global state, then I have a pretty good idea that anytime I see a function call, I know that so long as the arguments are independent and whatever the result variable I'm going to store the answer in is not being used in a subsequent statement, then I could reorder some of those things. I could, I, I could potentially even perform those operations in parallel. So that, that's uh, one aspect of a coding style to think about when you're going to start doing parallel programming is, is when will I be able to tell whether or not two things can be done in parallel and making that easier on yourself is a big win in terms of, you know, not accidentally introducing bugs when you start running ex executing code in parallel. Um, another aspect of things, and this comes back to the, the loop example of making it slightly more difficult um so making things slightly more difficult on yourself sometimes there there are some uh there are certain scenarios where you can't get around some of this but like the example on the left if i do know that funk doesn't modify global state then i can see that i am i am accessing individual elements of x and i'm assigning to individual elements of y we can do this execution in parallel because each iteration is independent. I only look at the value, one value of X and it, store it into uh, unique uh, elements of Y. So, so this is fine. For the loop on the right hand side, if we're, we're going to assume that J and K are uh, arrays of integers, right? So, I'm looking at an array of integers to figure out which element of X am I going to be storing the result of this in. If you know that the values stored in J are unique, then yes, you can do this loop in parallel. Because I'm not storing a different answer into the same element of X. But without knowing that, you cannot look at this loop and say, yeah, we can, sure, we can definitely do this, this loop in parallel. Because if there are non-unique values in the array J, then at some point, we're going to potentially have written to the same element of X at, at some point. So we might either do it out of order or maybe even somehow conflicting, try and write to it at the same time and that collision is, it, we're, we'll have a race condition. So, so that's something to be, that's another aspect of, you know, where you can introduce bugs in, in parallel programming. And for our last example, 
Imagine that I am running the code on the left and the code on the right at the same time. I've got two different processes and they're running the code on the left and the code on the right at the same time. If I did all of the left hand side before all of the right hand side, yeah, that things will work out because, um, you know, I, the, we're going to, the, the, the left hand side is going to say, okay, lock one is unlocked. So I'm going to lock it and lock two is unlocked. So I'm going to lock it. And then I'm going to work on some stuff using shared data. And then I can unlock those two locks and, and then move on. And so long as uh, the process running the left hand side has completed locking both of the locks, then the code on the right hand side will go, oh, uh, lock two is locked. I have to wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this loop and you know sleep for a second at a time and then double check and then check again. Like, hey, is that unlocked now? And then once the once the process on the left hand side is finished and unlocked those, then the process on the right hand side will will get to go through, lock the locks, work on the data, etc. But if they kind of step through in sequence, the process on the left hand side is going to say, hey, lock one is unlocked, I'm going to lock it. The process on the right hand side is going to say, hey, lock two is unlocked, I'm going to lock it. Now they're both going to say, well, lock, the process on the left hand side is going to say, lock two is locked. I'm going to wait. And the process on the right hand side is going to say, lock one is locked. I'm going to wait. And they're both going to be waiting forever. This is a deadlock because the process, the process on the left hand side is waiting for the process on the right hand side to unlock lock one. And the process on the right hand side is waiting for the process on the left hand side to unlock lock two. And they're never going to make progress. So this is this is a deadlock. These th something as explicit as this is far less often uh, less likely to actually be explicit. And you'll have a hard harder time spotting them than this. But this is the kind of thing that can happen that cause a deadlock is if we're trying to acquire locks out of order or uh, I, I mean, even in this case, uh, the, the acquiring of the lock on the left hand side, if there's some third process that between, hey, I'm checking whether lock one is unlocked and then trying to acquire the lock, it's possible that process three has acquired the lock. And now I assumed that it was okay for me to keep going, but maybe it's not, right? So that, there are lots of these kind of race conditions and, uh, uh, deadlocks and things that can happen when you're trying to deal with the coordination of mutual exclusion of processes executing certain certain pieces of code or accessing certain pieces of data. Okay, so having gone through some of the basic ideas and concepts, um, let's take a second to go look. Oh, I see. My chat ended up over there. Okay. Um, let's take a second to go look at questions. So, have we gotten any questions? Um, nobody has written any in the document, so I will give a second for anybody to unmute themselves and ask any questions. So, Hearing none, now is the time that I'm going to turn it over to Justin, and he is going to get give us uh, some give us a talk on performance profiling tools. So, Justin, are you there? Yeah. Uh, do you want me to share the slides, or are you going to share the slides? Um, it is up to you. Whatever is going to be more convenient. I wasn't okay. sure. Uh, live demo anything um, yeah i'm not gonna live demo anything why don't you share the slides and i'll just walk through that'll work
Okay. Okay. So this is going to be just a, a short introduction to uh, crate pads and performance analysis. Um, hopefully by the end of this, what you kind of have an idea of is what crate pad is and some of the terminology that it uses. Um, that you can use the perf tools like modules to collect some basic performance data. And then you can find more information on advanced usage of CrayPad um, because it's a very large tool and it has a lot of features for finding different types of data and collecting different types of data. And the Perf Tools Light modules are kind of just a introductory, introductory way of doing that. Next slide. Uh, so CrayPad. Uh, is initially just kind of meant for doing performance analysis on Cray-based systems, but it does work with other programming environments and tool chains. It is deeply integrated into the Cray programming environment. So if you use things like the Cray compiler and the Cray MPI, you will get bonus features that are not available to some other uh, libraries or tool chains. One note is that it requires that you run your application on Lustre or you set an environment variable to change your data directory because it uses record locking when it runs, uh, when it's recording data during runtime. So some of the terminology that's used when you are reading documentation on CrayPad and I'm gonna use when I'm going through things, um, when a user is performing performance analysis, we refer to this as exploring or as exploratory because the data that you're going through, it's not obvious every time. And sometimes you need to explore or go further and see what that data is actually trying to tell you. CrayPat sometimes will give you um, information on what is good and what is bad, but usually that data is something that you need to explore further yourself. Um, we refer to it as an experiment as the collection of performance data using an instrumented executable so that every time you run your application and you collect new data, we refer to this as a different experiment or rerunning the experiment. Um, an executable that is instrumented has been recreated from your original program, but with changes to collect performance data. Um, there's lots of different ways to uh, get data from the system, from the kernel, from performance counters, um, uh, to trace uh, functions, all sorts of things. The default experiment that's used is called a sampling experiment. And what it does is it collects samples from the program counter at some given interval. And this can be useful when you are first starting out and you're not really sure where or what your program is all about, or maybe where some of the bottlenecks might be. The more samples that end up in a certain function, then that can give you an idea of where most of your time is being spent. But sometimes those samples will show up in functions that don't make sense to you, or maybe are associated with something underneath the covers. Like a lot of the functions that are associated with threads, like uh, spin weight or something like that, might not make sense. And so we also have tracing experiments and these ones collect data for a selected set of functions. And what it does is it wraps a function so that when you enter and exit the function, it gives you an idea of how much time was spent in, what the arguments were, and what the return values were. And this is a lot better when you know what you want to explore. Like say, you have a list of user functions that you've created that you want to look at, or you have a specific set of mathematical functions or library functions that you want to look at. Or maybe you just want to look at your MPI message sending, and then you could trace your MPI library as well. Next slide. So Perf Tools Lite is kind of an introductory example of using CrayPad. And it's meant to be a simplified version that collects basic performance data automatically with little to no user you know, intervention. And this is works very well as an introductory because it gets a lot of good initial data that is helpful for just understanding what your program is. But that data can also be used in later experiments or in some of the more advanced features that the CrayPat suite can offer. 
when you're running a perf tools light experiment, the things that you're going to produce are a text-based report that's printed to standard out, but is also saved to an experiment data directory. Inside this data directory, you have the different types of reports that you might have generated during runtime, including a copy of the original one. You're going to have some AP2 files uh, directory that are process data files, and those files are uh, they can be moved around because they've been processed, and they can be consumed by other parts of the CrayPat suite, such as Apprentice 2 or Pat Report. The exit files are the raw data files that are written during runtime and aren't particularly useful, but they need to be processed to generate the AP2 files. Next slide. So the three experiments that I'm going to kind of introduce that you can take a look at are PerfTools Lite, which is the default option. It's a module, and it does a sampling experiment. And then it will also give you some execution time and give you an idea of what your top time consuming functions are. Uh, Perf Tools Lite Events is a tracing experiment that traces, generates a profile of the top trace functions and traces a default subset of functions. It doesn't trace all the possible APIs of which CrayPat supports dozens like Corey Fortran, MPI, Blas, LAPAC all the different scientific libraries, you know, it even supports curl as the API. So there's a lot of different things that you can trace and support, but this light experiment only sub does a subset. And the light experiment basically is a tracing experiment similar to perf tools light events, except that it also focuses on the program's use of GPUs, data sending back and forth, and then like kernel execution. Next slide. So the example we're going to go through is just uses Perf Tools Lite, um, and it kind of gives you the workflow that you're going to go through to generate the data. Um, you're going to want to make sure that the Perf Tools base module is loaded. It's always loaded by default on Perlmutter. Um, it doesn't do anything without loading a helper module, but it does give you access to the, the module to the man pages. And so you just want to make sure that that's loaded in case you do like some module purge or something like that. After that, you're going to want to make sure to load the Perf Tools Lite module. And once you do that, you are able to do your experiment uh, and build your code. Next slide. So in order to instrument your application, you have to have these modules loaded so that when you do a make or a compile or a Fortran call or a CC call or whatever, that they can, uh, that CrayPack can create this ex uh, instrumented executable and that it can take a look at the generated object files that you might not save, but are saved automatically for you. So when you compile and link your program, CrayPack has hooks into the linker and it has hooks into the compiler so that it can do all of these things. And so when your A.out is instrumented, it actually creates your original executable as A.out plus a ridge so that you can just run your regular A.out. And it'll give you this message letting you know that it did that. And then any object files that you are saving um, or that you're generating as a part of your build, even if you don't save them, Perf Tools has a hook into the linker so that it can save them into your home directory so that it can do the data analysis and the, ex, uh, and the uh, excuse me, the instrumentation that it needs to. Now, if you're not doing a make, that's fine. You know, all of Brad's examples just use a Fortran call and it generates from the source file to the executable. That's fine with these uh, light experiments. You don't need to keep the object files. It'll just give you the same warning below here saying, telling you that it's saving them to your home directory. And once you're done with your experiments, you can just blow that directory away and rebuild. You know, you don't have to keep that around. Next slide. So I had a quick question. So the, the, the FTN compiler wrapper, it, when you, when you load perf tools light, it, it just, it, uh, kind of hooks into that compiler wrapper. And so now the compiler wrapper is going to use the tool that is that the way that works? It, uh, when you load the Perf Tools Lite module, it, it has its own linker, and that's the linker that's being called, and it has okay. that linker. 
It does add compiler options when you load the light module. Those are not necessarily needed to be known by the user. Those are things like telling the Cray compiler to add extra instrumentation information to the binary so that we can draw more data out. Like uh, when you when you compile with OMP, there's also a flag for OMP trace, and you don't have to turn that on because the Cray, the Cray pet tells the Cray compiler to add that. Okay, but like if I if I load the perf tools light and then compile with like G Fortran or NV Fortran, will will those end up being instrumented or not? Um, that I'm pretty sure that they will still be instrumented because it's just using the linker in the background. But I would still just use the the wrappers because you're on a Cray and system. The wrappers are almost mandatory okay i i probably would have recommended the same i just wanted to clarify thank you um and when you're uh building your application and the linker is running in the background you can safely ignore this warning this is something that just happens right now um once the linker is upgraded to a, a newer version this morning it'll go away next slide So after you've built your program and, and CrayPad has instrumented it, you can just run your program and review the resulting report printed to standard out. Um, like I said, there are several other files generated in the data directory during this runtime, and you can review those as well. Next slide. So Brad's going to go over an example later on where he's doing some Mandelbrot stuff. And this is an example of the sample profile for that serial application. And you can see that almost all of the work is being done in one area where he's calling a function called Mandelbrot area. And all of the samples that you can see are almost all there. There is some thresholding that happens in the reports. So sometimes if, it, if things are like less than 1% or less than 0.5%, they won't be shown in this. But in this case, almost all the samples were just in this area. Next slide. This one kind of gives you an idea of where the samples were by line. So again, it was in the user function Mandelbrot area, but the line that you're, that you're caring about where it's doing most of the work is gonna be line number 21. And this shows you the source code of where that particular function also lives at. Next slide. And at the end, you can get uh, process time. In this case, for me, it took 29 seconds. But also during this thing, some of the performance counters were also being taken and recorded. So you're also getting some power management time since I ran this through S run rather than just running dot slash. And so you can get some power um, information out of this as well. Next slide. And so what's next? I just looked at the profile of my serial application and I know that Mandelbrot area is, you know, taking up everything. What do, what do I do? Well, you could try some other experiments if you want to see if you think that, you know, the data would be better shown in a different way. And to do that, you would just swap to another light module and relink or rebuild your application. Or if you think that you have an idea of what your optimization should be, you know, and Brad's going to go over how to optimize the different types of codes, um, you apply your optimizations and determine if your changes improve based on your next experiment. You could just rerun the same experiment after you rebuild your code um, with those optimizations and take a look at the report. Is the process time lower? Is it using less power? Is it using less memory? Where are the samples showing up? Maybe you should try a light report where you see where the events show up. Or you could just load the full Craypat suite and you can continue some more advanced techniques, either data gathering or different types of reports based on the data you've gathered or gather more data. And we have a whole bunch of information on how to do some of those other things on the NERSC website and also on uh, HP has uh, some pretty extensive documentation as well. And that should be it. 
All right. Thank you, Justin. That was very useful information. Hopefully, y'all can uh, try those tools out a little bit as we go through some of the demo and exercises. Um, but for now, uh, I'll switch over to a quick little demo uh, to talk briefly about some of the low-level parallelism aspects of things. So, uh, hop over to my editor. Um, so the, the example I wanted to start with when we're talking about kind of low-level parallelism stuff is uh, this vector examples, uh, vector instruction examples. Um, so this is just a simple little example where the, the idea is we want to calculate um, the, uh, the square, cube, and the fourth power of uh, consecutive integers. Right, so so at, at the beginning of the program, I've got an array where I'm just going to get, uh, so we're going to do 10,000 10, integers. Uh, so I'm going to get an array of just consecutive integers. And then we're going to try and do that calculation a few different ways. So the first way that we're going to do it is just individual loops, just kind of a naive, like, one integer at a time, calculate the square, then we'll go through a next loop and calculate the cube, and then calculate that to the fourth. Um, the, the next example is, well, well, we could do these, you know, we don't need separate loops for these. We're going to loop over the exact same number of entries. So we could do square, then cube, and then to the fourth power. Um, we could try it uh, using the implied loop syntax. So this is, um, if you're not familiar with this, is a slightly more modern Fortran feature where um, if you put square bracket parentheses um, and an expression, and then a comma, and then you can have loop bounds. So, uh, so i equals one to num entries. This will kind of do an implied loop and generate an array and so assign the array of squares to the squares array. Uh, ditto, ditto for cubes and to the fourth power, right? So we, we could try it this way. So this is in, in some ways similar to the individual loops, but using a, a slightly different feature of the language. Um, and then I've got I've got a place down here for you to kind of uh, play with different different ways of maybe rewriting this example and, and see if you can come up with uh, some example that might be faster than the others. Um, and I've just got loops where we're going to, uh, we're going to do the different implementations a whole bunch of times and then uh, calculate how long it took. So we can kind of see a comparison of what, what is the run time. So it's just some, some basic simple instrumentation manually seeing what's the runtime between the different implementations. So um, one thing you can look at as we start to look at some of this is if you use the dash capital S flag to the compiler, it will actually just output assembly. And you can look at what is the actual instruction set that the compiler is generating for these different implementations. Um, but if you're just Trying to run the example and, and look for timings, um, you could use different levels of optimization. Um, the dash O, 1, 2, 3, or 0 is for zo no optimization. So you can turn on different levels of optimization that the compile you would like the compiler to do for you, and then just run the executable and you know see what your timings are. So uh, module load prod and cray because we're going to use the Cray compiler for all of these examples. Uh, change directory into the vector examples folder. And I'm going to start off with uh, some fairly aggressive optimization for the, for the compilation. Uh, so compile the program. It'll take a minute because the, those levels of optimization uh, that's the compiler's going to do work to try and you know figure out how can I make this code go faster, uh, and then we can run run the executable, and so we can see that uh, 
at least for the for the Cray compiler, the implied loops are actually one of the fastest implementations. Uh, and if you run this multiple times, uh, you'll see you you get slightly different numbers. Um, if you want things to be slightly more stable, um, you can you can increase how long each one takes. You could increase how many of these different examples you're gonna or how, how many integers you want to calculate these for, etc. And so if you if you make the program take longer and run more uh, run the examples more times, you'll see. Uh, you'll see that the, the variation between each run of how long things take uh, will, will tend to go down a little bit. Um, but so that, that's something uh, to play with, um, just to kind of take a look at. So what what's going to happen with different optimization levels is the compiler is going to see, you know, code like, like these. And if it think, if it, if the code is simple enough, it might see that and go, you know, actually, I think it would be faster if I combined these loops. Or it might see a, a loop like this and you go, you know what, I think it might actually be faster if I split these loops back apart. Or, hey, I see this modern feature, but in this instance, I think maybe it'll actually be faster if I rewrote it like this. Or... It might even see something like this and see, hey, this looks an awful lot like I could rewrite it like this, right? So the different levels of optimization, the compiler can see that the, these are all equivalent. We're doing the exact same calculations. It, it can try and work out like, hey, can I rewrite this in such a way that I think it might be faster? And so if you look at the assembly that's generated, and I am not particularly versed in assembly instructions. Um, and actually, it'll be assembly. Uh, oh, that's going to be. I think we want to just have it generate the assembly. I think that's what. Uh, there it is. I suppose I could just, uh, there we go. So I'm not particularly well versed in assembly, but if you could find, uh, like, single loop. Uh, the compilers generally do a reasonable job of kind of the commenting the generated assembly is saying this is kind of where this come from. Um, so there's, uh, where did I see it? I thought I just saw it where it said separate loops. Yeah, separate loop. But you, you could probably work out that there are some instances where at some level of optimization, you might actually get identical assembly from two of these different ways of writing these. Um, so, let's see. Let's look at, so that was with, so with, you know, uh, optimization level three, you know, we get timings that look like that. What happens if we compile with a lower level of optimization? What do the timings look like? They're slightly slower, right? And in fact, sufficiently slow, but they're really close to being about the same speed. Um, right, so you can, you can see that there are some forms that the compiler may be better at optimizing and different compilers may be better at different forms but there are also some forms where like they might be they might look very different in the form but the compiler might actually be able to generate identical instructions for those for those various forms of the loops so 
what I want to do is I want to give you 10 or 15 minutes um, to download this example, make sure you can get it to compile and run, play around with it, play around with different uh, levels of optimization, and see if you can write a, a version that is faster than all of the other versions. And to start off with, I, I left it just the same as the separate loops. And oddly enough, that one seems to be the fastest to start off with. <laughs> but also, it is already, it may be noticing that it's already doing some of those calculations. So that it, it, play around with it. And uh, when we come back, we'll see. Uh, We'll see what uh, what speeds anybody's been able to come up with. So uh, I'll, I'll give you all 10 or 15 minutes and I will work on this myself as well. And we'll, we'll see uh, what speeds some uh, that we can come up with. So I will also start taking a look at uh, any questions if anybody's got them. All right, so it's been about 10 minutes. Does anybody have uh, some suggestions of uh, playing with the examples and I uh, think that they came up with an interesting suggestion for you know what, what what's the fastest way that you can get the squares cubes and fourths of the sequential integers feel free to unmute yourself and speak up if you've got any ideas so uh... In my case, I use the, for for example, for the cube, I use the squares value times the, uh, basically the integer value. And then for the fourth, I use cube times the integer value. Okay. Yeah, that's a pretty good example. Um, and did that, did that make it faster than the others? I think so a little bit, but yeah, not too much. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what optimization level? So I'm using the default optimization level. That okay. we have I event. think it defaults to three. Mm -hmm. Cray is like the one compiler that defaults to having all the optimizations on. Mm. I, I think that's right. Um, anybody else? Okay, well, I'll, I'll share and uh, show a couple of examples of what, what I tried. So, so I actually, I found out that, yeah, this is, this is probably about as fast as you can get it to go. This will make it the fastest, probably for most optimization levels. So, um, like at 02, it's pretty clearly, uh, oh, nope, the implied loop was just as fast for that execution and actually faster. Uh, and that time it was faster, right? So you'll see that there's actually a decent amount of variation. Probably this problem size is a little small for high levels of optimization because it can go pretty quick. Um, but at 03, yeah, I found that this was generally about the fastest. The, 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 this form was just about the fastest. Um, at 01, I think it was also the fastest. Um, nope, the implied loops were the fastest. All right, so you, you, one of the things you'll find out is that different compilers have different uh, levels of optimization that you can turn on. Different compilers are better at optimizing some forms than others. The, the, different levels of optimization may impact which form tends to be optimized better. And so like what, one thing that I was going to try was I was going to try and just go full in on modern Fortran and say, right, you don't even need anything explicit about there being loops for this to work.
but I found that that was generally the slowest way to do it. At least with the Cray compiler. Oh, that time it was the fastest. Right. So, yeah, now, now this is fast again. So it is highly variable. Um, and we can even take a look at the, I thought maybe I'd try out perf tools that Justin, uh, oops, thing. yeah, all right. Um, so if you turn on the perf tools, then as Justin pointed out, um, we'll start with a lower level of optimization. Otherwise the thing runs so fast that the perf tools don't collect any data. Um, but you'll, you'll notice that, uh, you know, we get, we get some of the informational messages about perf tools being used and I didn't even have to change my compile command. So that's a kind of an interesting feature. And then when you run the executable, uh, it will take a bit longer and then you'll get a whole bunch more output. So there's, there's my program output. And then the Cray Pat Lite performance statistics. Um, you know, how many samples did it do? They got 405 samples. It's kind of telling me that lines 87, 57, and 56 or uh, lines 84, 85, 86 were where most of the time was being spent, which is here in the implied loop. Um, and that was with uh, an optimization level of one, right? So, so you can start to kind of look, you know, what, if I try different implementations, which could also be a potential avenue for optimization strategies of like, okay, I, I, I see where I'm spending a decent amount of time. I'm just gonna do redundant calculations within different forms and see you which one is faster. Right. Um, so there, there are different avenues for exploring kind of the performance behavior and, you know, exploring different forms for writing the same problem to see what's faster. But my general takeaway is that because vectorization and optimization is so dependent on compiler and hardware, then the, in some cases, even the different code can result in identical instructions. Don't write hardware compiler specific code. Don't worry so much about the low level parallelism and optimization. That's the compiler's job. Just write code that's human readable. Because half the, t I mean, a decent chunk of the time, chances are pretty good that your hand-tuned optimizations won't be as fast as what the compiler does. That you're likely to get it wrong, even if you, like, you might do an optimization, or you might make a transformation that actually makes it harder on the compiler to do the optimization. And so what you thought was going to make it faster made it slower because the code that the compiler generated doesn't look anything like the code you started with, right? Trying to read the compiler's mind and write code just to make it go faster is probably not the right, the right job for a human being. Just write code that's going to be easier for other people to understand because even, the, even then the compiler Oftentimes, code that's easier for a human to, to understand is code that has been easier for a human to write for op, write optimizations for in a compiler. So if it's easier for you to understand, it might be easier for the compiler to understand. And the compiler is going to probably do a pretty good job of optimizing it. And also, you may be forced to change compilers. Yeah. The chances that the optimizations that you might make by hand will still be the right optimizations when you move machines, compilers, 
programming environment, whatever it is, the chances that those optimizations are still the most um, most optimal, most efficient, whatever it is, when you change anything else, are so small that it's just not worth doing. So there are low level optimizations that the compiler will do. Sometimes it will do some parallelism at the low level, like SIMD vector instructions, whatever. Just let the compiler do, figure that out for you. Don't worry so much about it. Okay, so um, we are done with part one a little bit early, so I think we'll just go ahead and take lunch early and we'll come back at the scheduled time, which is uh, 1.30 my time, it'd be 11.30 Pacific time. And uh, then we'll start talking about uh, do concurrent and OpenMP and look at some, some other examples and go from there. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording for now.